Welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for Wednesday, February 20th, 2013. We begin with interesting news from the world of technology. Whenever we discuss advances in robotics or artificial intelligence on Brainstorm, there's always the obvious jokes about Skynet or the robot uprising. But what if instead we took the time to get to know robots better? That's not really a hypothetical question for some people over at MIT who worked on ways to improve human-robot cooperation. Now, robots are already used extensively in factories and other manufacturing settings. And as they get more advanced, we are only going to see more. A fundamental issue is the difference in the ways humans and robots perform tasks. Robots are programmed to perform tasks the exact same way every single time, even when it's a learned behavior. Humans, on the other hand, aren't necessarily worse, but there is more variation in how they perform tasks. So with humans and robots working together, they can be a disconnect between the various stages of a process. Right now, most efforts to improve a robot's performance in this way have involved interactive reward. A human trainer giving the robot a positive or negative response based on its performance. In order to improve further, the MIT team borrowed from purely human group training, particularly the switching of roles. Essentially, human and robot teams went through cross-training and regular training in a virtual environment and then were asked to perform the real task. Obviously, it was a lot more complicated than that. The learning algorithms the robots used had to be adapted to learning through observation, for when the human was performing the robot's usual task but it did result in improvements compared to the non-cross-trained group. When performing their usual roles in the real world, the humans and robots were working simultaneously 71% more of the time. The time a human was waiting on a robot decreased 41%. And the robots had a significantly lower entropy, or uncertainty, when predicting what their human partner might do. All of this points to the fact that human-robot interactions may be improved by examining how humans interact with each other, and improving the robot's learning abilities accordingly. Next is an exciting update from the world of medicine. A study led by the Valdi Hebron Institute of Oncology has shown for the first time that RNA interference could be an effective cancer treatment. As you may have guessed, RNA interference involves small molecules of RNA interfering with or silencing certain gene expression. It's a natural mechanism within cells, crucial for development and differentiation. But it's also been looked at as an avenue for silencing genes associated with cancer. The problem has always been getting the RNA molecules into the cells at an effective concentration. Fortunately, they were able to develop a lipid or fat-based nanoparticle that could deliver two RNAs at a time. Eventually, they were able to advance to a phase 1 human trial, giving 41 patients with advanced and metastatic cancer an intravenous dose of the RNA-based drug twice a week. Now, phase 1 is only meant to determine the safety and any side effects of a treatment, not gauging its effectiveness. However, initial results are promising as 11 of the patients in the trial showed a stabilizing of condition, and certain metastases in the liver even showed regression although the liver is particularly effective at absorbing these molecules. Analysis of tumor biopsies before and after the treatment showed presence of the interference RNAs. This demonstrated that the lipid nanoparticle was effective and warranted further studies and trials, hopefully leading to an effective and targeted cancer therapy. Our final story comes from the world of chemistry. Researchers at Sandia National Laboratory and the University of New Mexico have developed a new way of preserving cells and much more. The process is relatively simple. Just take a mammalian cell and expose it to sicilic acid. It reacts to form methanol, which then softens the lipids in the cell membrane, allowing the sicilic acid to get into the cell and eventually create a layer of silica over the internal and external structures. Obviously, the cell dies, but these structures are excellently preserved in the silica, even on the nano and micro scale. This mineralization process essentially creates microfossils on demand and would allow scientists to preserve specimens indefinitely without decay or refrigeration. But this could also have practical applications. One thing that technology isn't great at, but nature is, is creating intricate three-dimensional structures on extremely small scales. So with this mineralization process, we can simply use life as a literal template for our nanostructures. 
Since the silica can withstand quite a bit of heat, certain enzyme reactions may even be more efficient than inside a living cell. Because the structures will be well adapted to the chemical reactions performed by the enzyme, but within a more rigid and stable framework. Plus, the researchers could create arrangements of multiple cells to fit any shape they needed. Of course, this is a new process that will hopefully be further developed, allowing biology to be the template for advanced chemistry, nanotechnology, and materials. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.